thank you all for joining us for the uh, plenary uh, panel on sustainable research practices. All the panelists kept asking me what I mean by that, and I did my best to clarify it, but the truth is I don't really know because I'm not that sustainable as a researcher, and I'm hoping they can help me figure out how to be better at it. Um, we had two additional panelists who had to withdraw, sadly, um, including uh, Jill Enan, um, but um, I thought what I would do is just introduce the four um, panelists that we have. I'll go ahead and introduce Kyle, too, so that when he comes in, you'll know who he is. And then I've asked each of them to speak for just, say, five to seven minutes on what, that, what the question of sustainable research practice means from their perspective, and then um, we'll open it up and we'll just have a conversation. So I hope that there'll be a lot of back and forth and we can sort of pool ideas and learn together. Um, so in no particular order, um, I'll start by introducing, uh, um, sorry, John P. Wilson. He's the founder of the Spatial Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. His research focuses on the modeling of environmental systems, and he makes extensive use of GIS software tools, field work, and spatial analysis techniques. He's published numerous books and articles on these topics in two edited volumes, one titled Terrain Analysis, Principles and Applications, and the other Environmental Applications of Digital Modeling. Much of his work is collaborative and cross-disciplinary with the goal of improving knowledge and understanding of the factors linking society, the environment, and human health. Online, uh, we have currently featured Ken Hiltner, who's a professor of the environmental humanities at the University of California at Santa Barbara, UCSB, and he directs the environmental humanities initiative there. Roughly one third of US, uh, UCSB's carbon footprint comes from faculty and staff flying to conferences, talks, and meetings. In response to this striking problem, for the past five years, he's been developing and experimenting with a nearly carbon neutral conference model that reduces greenhouse gas emissions by a factor of 100. Impressive. Our other online panelist is Andy Lipkis, uh, joining us from Venice Beach. Um, he's the recently retired president of Tree People, a nonprofit that inspires and supports the people of LA to come together to plant and care for trees, harvest the rain, and renew depleted landscapes. He has dedicated his life to healing the environment while improving the lives of individuals and communities. He founded Tree People in Los Angeles in 1973 at age 18. Andy has spearheaded an approach to using trees and forest-inspired technologies to make cities sustainable while mitigating extreme heat, floods, drought, pollution, and other climate impacts. This approach is being demonstrated in LA as a model for cities everywhere. And with impeccable timing, I am happy to also introduce our last panelist, Kyle Konis, who's an assistant professor of architecture at USC. His research centers on improving the feedback loop between design intent and the performance of buildings in use, with an emphasis on the experience of building occupants. Within this context, his primary focus is the study of daylight in buildings as an environmental service for addressing building energy, indoor environmental quality, and occupant health objectives. He seeks to develop novel performance metrics, participatory evaluation techniques, and data-driven design support tools, and lessons learned from the study of existing buildings and their occupants. Uh, these, these outputs are produced with the goal of building a body of evidence to support innovative design practices that more closely align project uh, performance with human needs and sustainability objectives. So uh, how about we do it in this order? I'll ask John to speak first. Um, each, uh, Kyle was just saying five to seven minutes initial comments and then we'll do a Q&A. So uh, John, then Kyle, um, and then Andy, and then Ken. Okay, so John. Hi. Everybody can hear me? Yep. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes first talking about sustainability as an object of study because that's going to colour how I think of sustainability as a practice in terms of being a professor. So, uh, you know, I teach a class called The Water Planet and, you know, things featured in there are climate change, species losses, freshwater supply. It's set up as a physical sciences class, but you can deal with none of those things without thinking of equity and inclusion because that cuts through everything about the world around us and everything about our lives. Uh, you can't talk about those topics either without talking about space and time, so it's about situational awareness. Uh, space, because there are parts of the planet where certain things would be appropriate and sustainable and other places where they could not be or would not be. And time, because uh, like, like people, places sort of have a momentum. And so if you, if you want to embrace and, 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 and participate in changing a place, you have to understand what the status quo would be. And the status quo is, is not some stationary uh, outcome. 
it's also broad and deep. Uh, everything about us and the planet is connected. Uh, indoors is connected to outdoors, outdoors is connected to indoors, public sector is connected to private, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as a consequence then, uh, all of the valuable work and discourse about uh, sustainability as an object of study is multidisciplinary. And, and frankly, we'll get nowhere uh, unless we pitch in uh, with large amounts of kindness. Uh, because uh, sustainability, I think, is uh, like my favourite sport in the world, rugby, a team sport. Uh, none of us by ourselves can win, right? So that's the science. Now, me as a professor, uh, I think if, uh, for any of us to be sustainable or for what, are, what we're doing to be sustainable, we need to understand uh, who we are, what matters to us, uh, our goals and aspirations. An example, uh, I have a law degree. I concluded I didn't want to be a lawyer. Uh, that was not going to be sustainable. Uh, I was once offered a job as a dean. Uh, I concluded at the end of the interview I didn't want to be a dean. That would not be sustainable. Uh, and so knowing myself here is partly about my goals and aspirations and, and partly about how I conduct myself. I try to be kind. At the same time, I try to be frugal meaning uh, I only try to commandeer as many resources as I, as I think I need to do something uh, that's valuable. Now, the valuable here uh, in, in my space is that I'm hugely interested in and a full-time participant in things that are multidisciplinary. At USC, I've so far built or helped build 16 different academic programs, and I think almost all 16 academic programs involve partnerships either with other schools or other departments within Dornsife. I, I mean to train young men and women uh, in the hope that they'll be motivated and equipped to go out and help change the world. That's my driver. Uh, I do that by teaching. I like teaching. I do more teaching than I'm required to do per my faculty con contract. I've done that for, I don't know, my whole life just about. I also like research. So I, as uh, Devon said, I write a bunch of books. I write lots of journal articles. I give lots of talks. Uh, that has far less immediate impact than the ability to motivate and, and equip students to go out and, and do uh, that work as well. There's a multiplier uh, through teaching and particularly when I can couple teaching and research at the same time. In the Spatial Sciences Institute we have about 120 majors and minors and about half of those are working on funded research projects either with uh, outside organisations like the Mayor's Office in the City of LA or with faculty. So to me, uh, sustainability as a practice is about doing the right thing, doing whatever I do with kindness, uh, understanding values and which ones are important to me, and in the multidisciplinary space, searching tirelessly for win-win situations. No partnership is going to last if both don't get some of what they want, right? There can't be a winner and there can't be a loser. There can't be a taker and there can't be a giver. Everybody has to give something. Everybody then presumably takes something. And so that's how, how I think about that. I'm not going to be as laudable as my colleague from UCSB uh, be because I fly a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I should do less of that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, apologies for, for coming in a little bit late today. I was uh, riding the expo in and doing, doing my part to support our public transit transformation. So um, I think I'll start with that. The city of Los Angeles, so I'm, I'm sort of trained as an architect and I have an um, advanced degree in building science, which is the study of sort of energy efficiency in, in buildings ultimately. Um, in the city of Los Angeles, we're at a crossroads. We're going from a city that's based on sort of single occupant vehicle mobility and road systems and single family houses to one of multifamily dwellings, increased densification, uh, and a shift towards um, the use of public transit. That's where the um, city's put its mobility plan, its planning process, and the uh, sustainability plan that the city's recently released uh, because we're here in L LA, is built around the idea of um, filling this critical shortage of, of housing. So I think that um, these ideas fundamentally are um, an effort to become more sustainable. They're driven by sort of statewide carbon reduction goals. 
Uh, but we can envision a number of scenarios where uh, we achieve our statewide goals or our sort of goals at a more regional level uh, while we don't address um, underlying uh, existing inequities. And I think, John, you started to bring that up. Uh, so how do we start to incentivize people to um, get out of their cars and sort of begin to participate in this new uh, public realm built around uh, public transportation? I think that... Um, coming from a school of architecture, that requires a shift in our thinking from the production of sort of singular and iconic buildings. That's ultimately uh, what architecture schools have trained students for, for generations to, to be skilled in producing. And the architects that we look upon as experts that we um, elevate as designers are those who can produce kind of striking and iconic works of architecture. Um, in my own training, one of the first projects I, I studied um, in a kind of scientific sense was the San Francisco Federal Building in um, San Francisco. This was a building sponsored by the uh, General Services Administration. And it's interesting because this was one of the three buildings that was singled out in the um, executive draft order uh, as a um, uh, a negative example of, of federal architecture. So in the, if you haven't been keeping up in the news, uh, you may have been distracted by the, the coronavirus, possibly. Uh, there's a big story happening in the world of architecture now that the um, architecture community is up in arms about, which is the draft executive order called Make American Buildings Great Again. I believe that's, that's what it's called. <laughs> and that's real. <laughs> And it's, it turns out it doesn't really come out of the Trump administration. It comes out of a, um, a group that is, um, some might call it a uh, community organization, but it's really a, a group of, uh, and this is actually apt for this conference, that wants to return um, the stylization of federal buildings or buildings sponsored by taxpayer dollars to classical architecture. So that would mean that every new federal building would need to mimic in some way the, um, the, the kind of iconic imagery of the, the White House, for example. Uh, so that's interesting because it raises this question of, um, as a democratic society, we should have expectations and standards for our federal buildings because those can be a kind of promising prototype for the way we want to uh, shape the built environment. So that, that's a good thing, in a sense, to uh, have an interest in setting some criteria for what would make a great building, right? We all want great buildings. But it brings up the question of how we judge and evaluate buildings as well and the built environment more generally. What are the criteria that we look at when we claim that we have a successful building or successful outcome? And the San Francisco Federal Building was actually one of the few buildings built in the United States after the 1950s where you could open the windows, one of the first large buildings that would actually be um, inhabitable in the absence of electricity because you could open the windows, you would have air for ventilation, the building would not overheat in the sun because it had been designed with adequate shading, and you would not need electrical lighting to be able to uh, occupy the building because it had a daylight, it could sort of operate in an autonomous sense during the day at least. So this was a very promising prototype for a building uh, in the 21st century, a sustainable building. And it was interesting the way it was judged because none of that uh, sort of performative um, range was, was uh, considered within this kind of judgment of the building. Uh, nor was any information, uh, given that we're making claims about the, um, the, the sort of human or, or end user you know, appearance or experience of the building, none of the evaluation of this building included any kind of feedback from the occupants of the building. And so if we think about uh, what would make a building sustainable? That might be you know, a building where we have some feedback coming from a population that is uh, confirming our assertions that this is a, um, a successful project. And, and so that's just an interesting um, sort of you know, news media piece and that to bring up to, to raise these questions of, of how, do, how do we evaluate um, project performance, whether it's a, an individual building or it's a, um, an effort to um, take cap and trade funds from our, our, our state's um, vast sort of proceeds of, of um, cap and trade resources and redistribute them to um, address environmental inequities. How do we judge that or how do we evaluate the successful outcomes of that? I think in terms of 
sustainability research, that's very important because we can't really innovate or advance uh, sustainability practices, however we define them, if we don't have accompanying processes and feedback mechanisms to, to evaluate our, our intent. And often, at least in the realm that I'm coming from, which is built environment and architectural design, uh, we often see these buildings on the cover of, of um, books or journal you know, publications without any real evidence of, of project performance. So a lot of my work is in participatory sensing or um, end user feedback tools that I distribute in buildings to give people a kind of systematic channel to report project performance. I try and use that information to um, make basic sort of judgments of what end user experience uh, looks like and then to try and model that uh, so that it can be used, embedded in the design processes that architects use to design future projects. Um, so one example of that was a project called Trojan Sense where we distributed uh, a sort of virtual thermostat to staff and students and faculty in selected uh, spaces in the USC campus. And we used indoor location beacons so people could pair their assessments of spaces with uh, the rooms that they were in. And we found that um, by giving end users a virtual thermostat, they were able to critique the indoor space conditioning of the campus. And we found that um, the warmer it was on campus, the more likely it was that people would report that they were too cold, they were being overcooled. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that, taking the USC campus, the majority of carbon emissions for the campus comes from electricity, and the majority of electricity use in buildings comes from efforts to refrigerate those buildings, not only in the summer, but really throughout the year. Those buildings are in cooling mode nearly all of the months of the year in our, in our climate. So giving someone a thermostat actually allows us to understand are the assumptions that we're making not only in the operation of those buildings, but in the conceptualization of a building as a, a sort of sealed and refrigerated container, are those actually uh, applicable in you know, our current times or as we look into a warming world? Uh, so that's a little snippet. It's going off of that, and I probably run over time already, so I'll <laughs> wrap it up. That's great. Thank you. And then um, we'll turn it over to uh, Andy and then uh, Ken online. Well, great. Good day, everybody. Um, I am coming <laughs> to you from Venice Beach, uh, just down the freeway, or down the metro line, uh, which misses me. Uh, so we've just had two presentations, one about sustainability and the first one about a little bit about uh, sustainable practices in research. I understand that the topic is sustainable practice in research. Um, do you want to give any feedback? I, I'm ready to talk about both. Uh, but I'll try, I'll try to keep um, my talk within that uh, five to seven minutes. But any feedback before I launch in, or should I just do both since we're doing no, both? I mean, I, just, I, I, you just, just talk from your perspective on the question of right. sustainability, not simply as a research topic, but also as we live our lives and as we work. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's perfect. My life is about sustainability, and it's also about um, cross-pollinating. Uh, I love the two presentations before, especially the grounding of kindness, because all of our information and learning and cross-pollinating, if you will, is effective or more effective if we're sensitive to um, equity issues, the pain and suffering that some people are existing through our lack of sustainability, where others of us are a whole lot more comfortable. Um, but in the end, uh, we need to be able to move as a community uh, to create the market for change, uh, to have people respond with the kinds of uh, information, um, technologies, opportunities, institutions that we need to thrive. Um, so uh, whew, I, the way I've done that over the last 50 years since I started Tree People. And our work, yes, it's about, uh, it started with about planting trees, but it was more about involving um, hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions of people in, in taking steps of making changes in their homes and their neighborhoods and their communities when government wasn't moving fast enough. And um, that theme resounds today as we're facing 
uh, tremendous acceleration of uh, severe and extreme climate impacts that are affecting uh, the lives of people in our communities, especially in disadvantaged communities and frontline communities that don't have as much uh, air conditioning and electricity where we have people uh, suffering and dying in Los Angeles from severe and extreme heat, uh, people in uh, perhaps uh, more resource communities dying and losing their homes in severe and extreme fire events. Um, and so the question that drives uh, the sustainability frame that drives my research and my work is how do we accelerate protections when we have um, a uh, federal government that is uh, not just in climate denial, but climate, climate lying, uh, uh, saying the science isn't settled where we have people dying in our community from severe heat, where we're losing people in fires, and where there are solutions that have been implemented around the world. So hence, what's the role of research? How do we make that happen? How do we involve and inspire not just policymakers, but the people uh, who have the power through our, occasionally through the ballot, even though it's not always listening, it's listened to, but certainly with our wallets to, to demand and back change with our own behaviors and with the things we buy uh, or the things we do with our institutions. So let me move from the concept into the practical. Uh, I'm really conflicted about. Um, sustainable practices in my research. Uh, in the next 10 days, I was supposed to be speaking uh, in Chennai, India, at a uh, World uh, Wilderness Conference uh, at Stanford in a uh, modeling, uh, sustainability modeling practice, and at South by Southwest. Uh, and uh, I've pulled out of all of those. I pulled out of South by Southwest hours before they shut it down yesterday. But uh, partly uh, because of COVID, uh, partly because um, I had a stunning awakening last year when I was um, uh, on a flight, waiting for a flight to Hong Kong where I was helping lead uh, a conference on um, climate adaptation and resilience. And the pilot said, sorry, it's taking a while to load the 30,000 gallons of fuel into this plane. And, uh, you know, we've always known, I always knew that flying, uh, you know, was a massive uh, impact on the planet, but I hadn't appreciated that it took 30,000 gallons of fuel to move 300 people across the ocean. And, and my piece of carbon, uh, carbonization got very, very real. Um, so I've been cutting back. And it's easy to cut back in one hand, and uh, I've just contracted with a number of researchers uh, around the country for feedback on how other cities are changing and adapting to severe and extreme climate, how they're protecting people. But, and, and I feel good, I, we're getting reports in, we're having uh, most of our calls uh, from my own team in Los Angeles or people around the world, we're using Zoom or Skype. That feels great and righteous, and I'm watching my footprint and costs really drop. But I'm conflicted um, because when I look back at the learning I did and the learning I do, and it may be that I'm a, a challenged learner and not a great student, but when I'm looking to move behavior change in a population, and I'm going to use Australia as an example, it was observations of communication styles, kind of personal experience of ethnography that wasn't documented anywhere that made the most uh, stunning discoveries that I've been able to leverage in a big way. And I'll just use an example. Uh, my first time down there was 1982 on a speaking tour, and um, I found Australians who were speaking, I thought, English, but saying words I knew nothing about. Uh, when people would greet each other, they'd say, G'day, how are you tanks? And 
I learned about boot and bonnet and jumpers and various things, but I just had to stop them and say, what are you saying? How are you tanks? And um, they slowed it down and was, how are your tanks? What that was, and everybody in a bunch of communities that I saw were greeting each other with this question. And how are your tanks with people inquiring how the water level was in their cistern, in their water tank? This is because they were um, at the, uh, in the midst of a drought, and the way that they had responded to drought was taking an old countrywide countryside tradition of rain tanks, water tanks, and moving them into the cities and into neighborhoods where people were harvesting the rain and using it to survive, using it to get by for their needs. And, um, but the expression was more than what's your water level, it's how are you getting by? How is the weather? How are you managing? Do you need some water? Do you need some help? There was a whole level of community connectedness concern that together, you could call that, you know, in the broadband kindness and connectedness, but together it represented a shift of millions and millions of people changing a lifestyle, supporting each other in a massive change that um, then it was so effective that it radically cut down on their water use, got them through uh a 12 year drought called the millennium drought. And for me, created a whole new level of feasibility for how US cities, uh, how California cities could adapt rapidly to our new long-term water shortage. And I wouldn't have gotten that. Nobody would have written that. But as I explored it and did further research, it looked better and better. And then when I brought it back here and started telling state officials, city officials, um, and federal officials about the effectiveness of harvesting rainwater and how it could work. Everyone thought I was nuts. Um, and I saw how similar Australian lifestyles were to California lifestyles and that that technology could easily transfer here. But in my words, it didn't mean anything. Even in showing slides, I didn't move any policymakers. So I had to actually organize a delegation tour of the head of the state water board down to the head of sanitation, the head of flood control, 20 people from various state and county and local agencies to go there. And I said, I know you don't believe it and your life is about to change. And you know, we would walk around town, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide that had very similar climates, very similar lifestyles, and and see homes where people had water use meter monitors on their kitchen counter, giving them feedback about their tap use, their recycled use, their tank use. It was a whole different world. That if I didn't, if these people in power didn't go there, visit it, and see it, they wouldn't have believed it. Um, if they didn't here when we walked up to people on the street and say, what do you think about a city like Los Angeles that takes all its rainfall and throws it away? And to a person, and excuse my French here, people on the street would respond, are you fucking suicidal? You must be crazy. And for state top officials to hear that in their face and see people thriving, uh, and not suffering from a lack of water, help them make significant policy changes here, back here. Um, and so that is just a glimpse of um, the span of uh, my conflict of the need to do more than read reports that I've commissioned uh, or listen to people, to be able to observe uh, things that aren't in words, lifestyles, expressions, kindness, um, is critical. So, uh, I don't know. I, I think we have to um, actually work on carbon offsets to be able to allow really important research that is hands-on, that is human to human, that is situational to, to support uh, transferring and accelerating transfer 
of good lifestyle changes, technology changes, when we have uh, a belief that keeps us apart, thinking that we can't change like that, that keeps us locked into very unsustainable living practices and power and energy and water use practices that wind up hurting and killing the people in our communities because we haven't advanced the changes that are within reach. And I'll, I've got a lot more, but I'll uh, save that for more rounds. Thank you, Andy. And then uh, Ken? Yeah, well, um, first off, my video may cut out, having a little problem with this program, but if it does, I'll, I'll bring it in. Um, first, um, gee, I second the thing regarding compassion, for sure, kindness. And, and I'm glad I'm following Andy, first with his story about um, the 30,000 gallons of jet fuel and the anecdote. But I, I thought I'd talk about the, the hardcore numbers here with what air travel's about. And to preface that by saying, what I do is approach things from a humanities perspective, not sciences. So I'm not so much interested in like new technology, but rather um, how we can change human behavior, human actions, because it seems that's principally the problem. And, you know, air travel may not seem like a big deal, right? Uh, globally, maybe two, two and a half percent of total greenhouse gas emissions come from air travel. Um, not a big deal. Some things like cement are twice that. But the problem is we have to realize it's a very select group that are flying. 19 out of 20 people on the planet has never stepped foot in an airplane. Even among Americans, half do not fly annually, and very few fly three or more times a year. So if you actually look at air travel, only 1% of the um, global population is doing 80% of it. And the problem is air travel, there, there is no other way to cause more damage more quickly to the planet than in air travel. If you fly from LA to New York and back, you'll be in the air for like less than half a day. And you will have, if we're to take serious the allotment that they put forward at COP21 at the, you know, the Paris Agreement, you, you will have pretty much blown your carbon allotment entire year in half a day. And the problem is um, we scholars are doing an enormous amount of flying. So we actually did an assessment here at UC Santa Barbara, UCSB, and we took, uh, we tried to do a figure out our carbon footprint for the entire campus. And we took into account, you know, not only the regular uh, buildings, labs, dormitories, foods, cafeterias, everything into account. And we found that a third of the carbon footprint for the campus came from air travel staff and, and faculty flying around. To put a number on it, that's 55 millions of yeah, pounds of CO2 or equivalent gases every year for one campus. To put that in perspective, you know, that's equivalent to a city of about 27,000 people in the Philippines for their total lifestyle. And is more students, both graduate, undergraduate, and faculty that we have at UCSB. So it's an absolute huge problem across academia. So my little intervention is we've been experimenting with different ways of doing conferences in part this conference is, is trying to do that as well. But we go about it a little differently because, again, since I'm interested in cultural change, I'm also um, concerned about the problems that already existed with academic conferences. So to give an example, because air travel is, is such a big part of it and so expensive, it means that you know to travel to North America or the EU from pretty much anywhere in the developing world, anywhere in the global South, literally that you know that plane ticket is going to cost you more than you know the annual per capita income in those countries. So that's meant, even though we haven't really talked about it, that we've summarily excluded a broad swath of the world's scholars from conferences. They just have not been able to take part in them. So um, and and doing an event like this, while great, doesn't necessarily fully solve that problem because of a huge time change difference. So what we've worked on is um, a very simple, and again, I'm not a technology guy, uh, but a very simple approach, and that is to um, pre-record the talks and to upload them to a platform and to put three or four talks on a page, and this is a web page, and that comprises a, a panel. And underneath of that is the Q&A, which is a text-based Q&A. So um, to imagine it, imagine you're looking at a YouTube page, but instead of seeing one video, you're seeing three, everything else is cleared away, and then there's a discussion space below. To make that work in practice, we keep the conference open for three weeks. 
And that means that even though people across the globe may have, you know, 12 hour, eight hour time difference, whatever from you, you can pose a question in the Q and A and someone will answer it a few hours later. And, you know, an exchange can take place, you know, 10, 15 comments over a number of days. Um, the interesting thing about that approach is we found that, you know, compared to a typical conference, and we actually looked at like how much, you know, discussion goes, uh, takes place at a Q&A like this. On average, our Q&As are generating three to four more times comment, uh, of discussion, and in some cases, 10 to 15 times more. And in fact, because we have so much discussion going on, there's there's really no reason to to create like um, conference proceedings because everything is actually archived online, and it's decided it's designed to stay up online uh, for to address another problem with conventional conferences, and that is. You know, they're sort of ephemeral. Things get spoken back and forth. People who are there benefit by it. The rest of the world doesn't. Uh, with our conferences, everything stays up online forever. So you have a full conference proceeding, always available, always open to anyone. There's no paywall. There's no password protection there. It's, it's fully open. Um, I'm not necessarily pitching this as the only way to do something, but um, with a campus like mine, and again, we're just one of 5,000, you know, um, colleges, universities in the U.S., huge. I mean, billions of pounds of CO2 are being expended every year to fly people around to give 15 or 20-minute talks. And I know that there's a lot of discussion that goes on at conferences, and I take Andy's point about other things that can happen. But, you know, we also live in an era where people are, you know, creating and maintaining relationships online by things like YouTube and social, I'm sorry, uh, Facebook and other social media. And in fact, you know, if you ask a younger generation, they feel absolutely as strong about the relationships that they've created and maintained online as the face-to-face -face ones. So I just think we really need to rethink this and do it very quickly quickly because otherwise for academics, you know, you may have a hybrid car, eat a plant-based diet, do a range of other things, and in one flight, you're going to nullify all the gains made by that. So again, I, I don't I don't know the full answer, but I know we need to do something and we need to do it very quickly. So I guess I'll end on that note. Thank you, Ken. That's great. Um, and I will say for those uh, following online, if you uh, make sure you click the link below the video and it'll, it'll pull up a bigger interface where you can uh, post questions through the chat interface for the panelists. So please just type your question and I'll feed it out to them. Um, before we turn over to the wider q and I'm just curious if anybody has any response to um, another panelist or, or if they just want to sort of hear from the audience. I'm the audience. So. Thanks so much for four really fascinating small snippets of um, perspective on the issue of sustainable research. Um, I guess I have a question that I don't know um, the answer to. I don't know if anyone does have the answer to it, which is what is the carbon cost of the new technologies that we use? Um, that that keeps cropping up uh, in my um, in my head as I think about our increasing reliance on these massive, you know, server farms, and um, they're in Iceland and they're wherever else they are. And so I'm I'm curious about that and how that gets factored into equations of um, sustainability. And my second sort of more thought than question, I guess, is that. Um, you know, I've, I've been a resist. I've been resistant to online teaching for um, a long time because I feel like there is such a value of people together in a space, and perhaps you know, in terms of the sort of conference model of the international participants, you know, that is unsustainable. But there's you know, there's more than just listening to papers and even discussing within a formal situation at conferences, there's also all of the hanging out at the coffee stand and um, bumping into, um, you know, all, all of the other things that happen sort of in um, real time, in real space, in real connection that I think is lost when we move um, to, these, to these more purely online models. So 
that's just a comment rather than a question. <laughs> I, I could jump in on that if it's okay. Um, so, so to, to first um, address the first part of it, um, you know, studies vary, but probably about 10% of all global energy use may be going to online activities and all now. And the lion's share of that is being taken up, of course, by video, exactly what we're doing, um, but not our video, things like YouTube and Netflix and all that. So it, it does take an enormous amount of energy, but one thing to keep in mind with that, it's all terrestrial-based electricity. And what I mean is, um, you know, you have to be using non-renewable fuel for a jet airplane unless you use something like biofuel, which presents its own set of problems. So you can use electricity to, to run this and hopefully renewable energy as well. Uh, to the second part, I, I take that point, but I, um, I'll just give a little mention that I um, currently have an 860 student um, class I'm teaching, uh, but it's actually in a lecture hall, so it's not entirely online. Uh, but I have the students doing online discussions back and forth with each other. And um, they actually, I post that over 30 videos online and they have to comment on it and comment on each other um, what they have to say. And as a consequence, they're probably going to generate about 5 million words of discussion. And I, 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 I take the point, but you know, it's so often been my case, if you're in a, uh, even a small seminar of 10, 15 people or whatever, Three, five, eight are talking, the other half isn't. There, are, there may be ways of getting far more people involved with something like this. Um, and, and I do take the point about the, the water cooler thing, but, it, but again, I mean, we can do things online, we can have relationships online, but I mean, it's the staggering problem here. I mean, for many scholars, it literally, this uh, flying will double their carbon footprint Double the carbon footprint of a typical American, but remember, a typical American is already eight times more than we should be to get, you know, down to the levels of the um, the Paris Agreement. So, you know, you're really talking about being eight, fifteen, twenty times more than you need to, than where you need to be for all of us to to live sustainably on the planet, and that's all coming from flying. So, yeah, absolutely trade-offs, but you know, it's just a big issue. Anyhow, sorry. Uh, I, I might just say about the first question that uh, while uh, carbon footprints are super, super important, uh, if, if we really have as our goal a sustainable planet, uh, we need to think far more broadly than just the carbon footprints, right? So, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a, a very well-regarded person at Yale, E.O. Wilson, I think, and he has this idea and he has a lab now built around this idea that of the half earth, if, if you could keep half the earth free of people, uh, then that would take care of everything. And, and while a laudable goal to, to uh, motivate people to think more seriously about their role in their world and their relationships with other people and the world itself, uh, I don't think that's a, actually a very laudable goal because uh, uh, it implies, among other things, that with the other half of the world, we could do whatever we wanted and we'd still be okay. That's not true, right? Uh, and so uh, we need fundamental change that, that, as Andy was pointing out, I think is the responsibility of the, of the public sector often, but they tend, tend to misread that, I think. Uh, we need what Ken's talking about, people to, to set goals that are consistent with the available opportunities and that have sustainability one generation to the next. And the, the role of equity and inclusion here is that it can't be that we have all the resources like traditionally we've had and, and the Global South has none of them, right? So it's not just about that they can't participate in conferences. For most of what we think about as life, they can't participate in that either, right? And so the, these are serious times and, and we need scholars in all fields to get together to take care of these things. Yeah, I think we've been talking about um, carbon emissions as one of the limits to travel. So that's a sort of restriction on travel, but there are many other travel restrictions, economics being one that's also been brought up. Uh, but I'll bring up the, the recent travel bans as, a, as another example where when we think about online uh, platforms, we're actually opening up opportunities for a large uh, 
population globally now to participate in events that they otherwise would have little to no chance of getting a, a visa to attend. So uh, it just struck me because I was on the USC campus yesterday, there was a poster uh, for um, a woman named Mariam um, uh, Mirzakhani, who is the only woman to win the field uh, medal. That's the most prestigious uh, award. It's the Nobel Prize of Mathematics. And uh, interestingly, she would not be allowed to attend a conference in the U.S. I think she, you know, taught at Stanford, so had ultimately gained citizenship. But as a as a Ph.D. student, she would have never been admitted to the United States under Trump or under previous administrations. That visa just would not have been granted. So the idea of being around the water cooler, and we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, um, there aren't a lot of female mathematicians who've won the you know the field prize that's a the field medal rather fields medal i always get that wrong so so when we think about um the idea of um a, a symposium or a conference where you could uh, you know attend participate comment and engage that's that's fully online that's free that's open and that's that's uh facilitates different time zones that opens up uh, these amazing kind, of, and, and when we think about even the possibility of language translation uh, being layered on top of that, that opens up a new kind of water cooler in my mind, which is much more inclusive and much more international. Uh, has nothing to do with carbon, but there's a huge co-benefit there in terms of emissions. So I, I really am kind of getting behind this idea of a future uh, academic experience that is. Uh, delivered virtually and I you know coming from School of Architecture we are all you know starting to live inside of computers now in terms of the way we envision buildings and indoor environments uh, you know everyone's already on their screen so it seems to me that this is this is very promising but I wanted to bring that up because I think often we we discount these um, these kinds of travel restrictions because they haven't yet been applied to us sort of you know people in our families uh, but it's it's coming not to end on a kind of a dark, dark <laughs> note there. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like to piggyback off of that previous question because I think it's really interesting. Um, and I guess I'll ask a question that for me pertains mostly to classrooms, but I think could also pertain to conferences, um, which is thinking about online classrooms. I think the like most of the feedback that I hear from other instructors about teaching online is that online classrooms can sometimes prevent professors from being able to um, maximize like the creativity of their classrooms um, and have sort of like imaginative instruction because at least for my university um, we have like a world campus I guess um, and all of those courses are just like sort of prepackaged designed courses you can't alter anything in the course materials you just administrate basically and grade so I wonder and then also in terms of like, if we're gonna move conferences or just like research proceedings sort of into those um, online categories, then how do we keep creativity um, in this kind of larger, like more open, more inclusive water cooler space so that it's also inclusive and still innovative too? Well, I, I could jump in if any, yeah. anyone else. Um, so the the thing about it, you know, um, a lot of things are going to change here. And it, you know, we just have to, so again, sort of coming at it from my point of view as a cultural historian and interested in how cultures change, we're at a moment where culture is going to change. Um, I don't know that an online conference, you know, you, you don't have the water cooler aspect of it, but you have other things that are really interesting, it seems to me. So, you know, for example, conference um, talks like this one, again, are kind of ephemera. They go away. They're not around. But in this this case, you know, everything is online everything is archived and it's it's there and it creates you know whole new ways of of thinking about exchange and all so um with our conferences and again you know i'm not saying it's the only way to do it um or even the best way to do it and i wish someone who really knew something about programming would figure out the best way to, to do it but um you know the presentations themselves become a small part of it so for the the amount of you know actual words spoken at the presentations 
we're getting, you know, four or five, ten times more online discussion back and forth on that. And again, it's not, you know, at the water pour kind of discussion, but it's radically different than a 15 or 20 or 30 minute Q&A period where people have more time to think about their comments, they research their comments, they're putting links into their comments, they're, you know, they're, they're building relationships online that will get people, you know, talking for, for, you know, for years afterwards with the relationships that they make because they're made online. But to, to go to the other point, just to underscore it, you know, in, in most of our conferences, we've had people from all over the world and one we had, um, you know, people from six continents taking place. And um, one really stood out for me, which is a conference that took place right at the uh, 2016 election. And the conference was going on online and immediately a huge discussion erupted about that. But it, it wasn't, again, a 15 or 20 minute conference around a water cooler. Um, it was multiple days that ultimately amounted, amounted to like over 25,000 words of discussion and a great deal of it coming from the global south regarding what happened during the U.S. election. So it's different, but um, I think it's excitingly different in a way. I mean, it just opens up different possibilities. And again, I'm, I don't know this model will work, but but I think there's something to this. That, that's been my, my one resounding thought, I guess. Uh, really quickly, um, I would just say that I hope it's okay with all of you. We're recording this talk as well as all the plenary events for posting online. And cool. based on this comment, um, I'm going to make sure that there is a, some sort of chat interactive function associated with this video so that people uh, who watch them can sort of engage in a conversation. Yeah. I think of my students to get it started. So it's a great idea. John? Uh, so I, th I think you must be from Penn State, right? That's the world campus you're talking about. Uh, so uh, m my unit at USC, we run uh, currently four master's degrees. Uh, two of them are residential and two of them are online. And uh, the first thing I'd say about that experience, which I think backs up what the other speakers have been talking about, is that we've come to the conclusion that which one of those modalities you've picked then determines who your audience is. And if you were to pick both modalities, you would have maybe twice the audience, but you'd have two different audiences. I don't know whether the number twice is a accurate yet. And so from my vantage with the unit that I'm responsible for, that's how, how we're going. And so, you know, when I pitched that idea, the first question I got was, well, why didn't you do that when you started? And, and the difference from 10 years ago to now, because we're talking about a decade, is the, is the video piece, right? So I, 10 years ago, I might, I might have been more, more likely to agree with you, but I think now I'm I'm less likely, you know. Uh, and, and so then then whether or not you you can, it's getting easier and easier to do that, and and whether you could capture the the all of the nuances of actually being physically present doing something online, then is is about how careful and thoughtful the institution is in setting up in the the environment in, in which the if there's a presentation, the presentation takes place, right? Uh, and, you know, the advantages I see are the ones that people have spoken about. So what I'm already exploring is uh, at least one of my programs is going to be stood up in, in our engineering school, which has uh, a very long and well-established sort of technology workflow to do this. And, and like today, they, they record the lectures. The, their expectation is they're available to students 30 minutes after the class. Uh, they're available to students 24-7, so you could take two or three or four takes at some of a lecture, all of a lecture if you wanted. And, and then as, a, as an educator, I have the ability to slice and dice those materials so that I could serve different audiences with some of the same content. Uh, and so, uh, to what everybody's been saying, uh, I think a few things are different. There's maybe a few losses, but if we think creatively about it, that there's a world of, of new opportunities that we could gain that would help with a whole bunch of things, including sort of equity and inclusion. Devin, behind you. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for your thoughts. Um, kind of on that opportunities angle, um, I wanted to kind of ask about how to stimulate discussions and collaboration uh, across disciplines that have traditionally been very siloed, I think. Um, I mean, these issues of energy that we've 
talked about from different perspectives show that this isn't just a question of physics, right? I mean, it's a question of access to energy, these inequalities of who is using energy and who is affected uh, by this energy use. So it's a wide range of disciplines and perspectives that is required to address such topics. And, and much of the literature I, I have read on, sustain, on successful sort of transdisciplinary projects kind of privileges the direct contact between people working in different disciplines, you know, highlights these, these conversations, which almost always seem to happen in person, right? Um, by which we kind of bridge these different knowledges, discourses, etc. So I'd be really interested to hear any thoughts from, from any of you on this topic, really, and, and about collaboration, and, and perhaps really whether these virtual ways of doing conferences might actually facilitate such work in interesting ways in terms of providing access to different people from different disciplines and, and, and breaking down some of these disciplinary boundaries in terms of collaboration. So some thoughts there. Um, I'd like to pick that up. It's Andy. Do I need someone to switch? Are you there? No, you're there. Oh, great. Okay. We'll so, um, the core of my work has been facilitating um, collaborations amongst different engineering disciplines uh, to manage the urban ecosystem as a whole ecosystem instead of just the water supply, just the flood control, just the wastewater. Uh, just uh, the energy systems, which so all we've taken the whole ecosystem and broken it up into different disciplines and uh, literally disintegrated it into different engineering disciplines who then have different languages or even different meanings for the same words in English. And I've been for the last 30 years working both to prove that it makes sense to to fix our system, to bring all the disciplines back together, to, to look at the whole, manage the whole. And um, we have to have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings with groups and including the community in the session. So I'm, I'm telling this story because I may kick it back out to the experts in the room and like, well, how do we deal with this? Um, just getting the agencies to agree to a process where they collaborate in design uh, has been quite a big challenge where somebody who's normally the lead in engineer, lead agency uh, to let go of uh, that control is a big thing. Why? Because uh, flood control, water supply, wastewater, water quality, they're all water engineers, but every one of those separate disciplines is actually um, trained differently and regulated differently. So each each discipline is operating with fear. If they blow something with the design and the infrastructure and it winds up hurting someone or polluting, they're gonna be fine or causing a flood. And they don't trust each other. Their, their metrics are often different. Their disciplines are different. But we've been able to, through really intense face-to-face -face work, and include, including the community in these stakeholder processes, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. The challenge I'm trying to integrate with this whole conversation we've had is I've often had to play the role in facilitating or self-facilitating a group uh, uh, is to notice when people are using like, uh, the same word, like a word like infiltration, uh, wherein uh, a community in Sun Valley, the first environmental justice zone in, uh, declared in the city of Los Angeles where we were trying to build a watershed project instead of a drain to get rid of the water, but to capture it, clean it, put, them, put it in the ground and re retain the value. The highest value that everybody had to learn from the different disciplines as well as the community was the notion of infiltration. We, we live in a community that throws away all the water that falls here high value, we're literally outsourcing our water and losing jobs and cash. So they learned infiltration. They're a year and a half into the process. Then a wastewater engineer, the head of sanitation comes in and presents, talking about the sin and the horrible thing about infiltration. Uh, and the whole group is feeling attacked. And like their last 
last year and a half has been wasted. And I, had, and I just saw everyone crestfallen and I went, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He actually means something entirely different with infiltration than you think he means, than you've learned. He's talking about broken pipes and sewage uh, infiltrating into the ground. And that's a massive issue for a wastewater engineer. And they can be, you know, sued and fined and, and really uh, in trouble for that. And, and so what I tried to illustrate here is there's multiple levels of facilitation that we have to do in any conversation, really. And it becomes not impossible and maybe not even more difficult as we design these kinds of remote uh, sessions. But it gets even more difficult if we're looking at how do we do this in a not real time conversation uh, where people may have checked out for a couple weeks and missed the correction. They may have checked out because they felt offended or, or like invalidated, who knows? Uh, I love the challenge and I think we can probably figure it out, but it's these kinds of conversations we have to have as we design care experience and, and move forward. And you wouldn't think about this necessarily in a system design, but it's critical. I hope that was useful. It's great, thank you. So thank you all for these really interesting snippets uh, um, and um, I have kind of things that, that each of you have said I've been really thinking about. Um, but my question is really going to focus back on this term research uh, and how to actually do that uh, in a sustainable way. My, I am an art and architectural historian. I am uh, committed to looking at things that exist in their own spaces. I learned about this uh, edict uh, about the uh, the architecture of Washington from the East Building of the National Gallery, I am Pays. And um, so art historians tend not only to need to travel to look at stuff, we can't check it out from a library, we also need specialized libraries because that's how the discipline has essentially been set up. And um, I've had conversations about this with colleagues and we've talked about, well, we should only research the things we could walk to. And that's not, I think, a good model actually because I've worked a lot on Northern Europe and I know that the kinds of questions that I ask as an American are so different from the disciplinary questions that people who are from those places ask about their own stuff. So I'm really you know, thinking about a next project, um, about how to do something that is relevant to the, th the questions that I have, the intellectual questions, but also is literally sustainable to be able to work on. So um, I wonder if you have thoughts about this. Um, I mean, art historians are notorious for relying on slides, but we do that as a proxy. Uh, and we do that often, we take our own slides because we've seen that thing, we know what it looks like, and we know what we want to be able to, um, to look at, in a sense, because we've seen it in the original. So this is my issue, it's like the original. <laughs> um, I could jump in on that. Um, and first, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question and it, it underscores how different methodology is across academia, you know, so um, I'm a Grutta literature expert, so we don't have that problem. Um, and the kind of archives we have to access, we have, you know, access to now. So, um, uh, but it, it does um, draw attention to the fact that, you know, new technology with respect to like libraries and archives is now changing a great deal. There's a, there's a mad rush in my field for the last 20 years to get every possible thing up online. And you know, keep in mind too that uh, you know a range of new technology is available now uh, at a very inexpensive point. So, um, with respect to video and then um, slides as well, you know, two billion people on the planet now have complete access to high definition video of the quality that are typically broadcast. Not only to view it on you know a high resolution iPhone, but to generate it. I mean, these phones can do like 4K resolution and all. So I don't quite know how a sustainable project would work in your field, and I'm totally out of my depth in suggesting it. Um, but you know, it is possible to archive 
huge amounts of images, video, high definition, 3D, and all now in a way that we couldn't have done even a few years ago. You remember what video was like just a few years ago on your TV, on your computer? It was small, it was choppy, it didn't work half the time. Now it works all the time, and it's, it's actually becoming totally usable for anyone. So if you have like FaceTime on your phone, you know how simple it is to use. So I don't know how it could work in your field, but one wonders how technology could be deployed there. I mean, it's, it's a great question to ask, the question you're asking about sustainable practices for your field. If I can jump in really fast, um, this is Devin again. Um, the, I think the corollary would be something like book history, which is something I work in a reasonable amount as, an, as a literary scholar, which hyper-privileges the physical artifact and hyper-privileges research projects that are demonstrably based upon extensive travel and visiting archives in person. Um, and I point that out um, to sort of indicate a much wider issue, which is that part of what also has to happen is the way that we incentivize certain types of scholarship to the sort of mechanisms of uh, promotion and advancement. I mean, I know my third year review for my tenure, the number one recommendation was I need to conference a lot more, right? I mean, I had enough publication, but I need to get out there and conference, right? And you know, as these things go online, uh, you can see how maybe that kind of requirement evolves in a, in a more sustainable direction automatically. But I think we might want to think about um, the things that are really built hard, hardwired into the structure of academic careers, right? And especially these things that are supposed to differentiate a high-profile career. Um, um, and you know, I think it was John who brought up this idea of momentum, right? And the sort of momentum of academia in terms of you know just what it looks like to become a professor. Um, it has a ton of inertia, right? We, and it's sort of hardwired into administrative protocols, right? That in, in the sort of metrics that, that we build into these careers. So maybe these are the things that we need to be looking at too. Can I can I just take a stab at a question too, though? Yeah. Uh, I would I would hope the the goal would not be that none of us are going to travel anymore. <laughs> uh, so you know I like most things in life I think about moderation, uh, and then then in that context, you know because that's you know you could think that's a cop out. Uh, how I think about that for myself is sort of the uh, the cost, uh, which is measured not just in financial terms but lots of other ways like carbon footprint and so forth. And then well, what was the value proposition? What was on the other side uh, in terms of the outcomes? And, and uh, you know, one thing I, I've come to worry about about the academy is that I see a lot of people that are busy, where busy apparently is both the activity and the outcome. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, I, I don't see that being sustainable. And it's in the, in the broader sense of the world has a finite set of resources of one kind or another, uh, not a wise, wise use of some p portion of those resources. So we'd have a, we're, for me to answer your question sort of carefully and thoughtfully, uh, I'd, I'd need to know a lot more about both your motivation, what you actually do, what the outcome is, who do you share it with, uh, th these kinds of things. Right? Uh, I was trained as a geomorphologist, and, and I can say one thing. I, after the first couple of years of classes, thought that I probably had, it, had everything mastered. You know, every class I'd done, I'd got an A. Uh, people would speak highly of my answers on exams and presentations and so forth. And then there was a field course where you had to go out in the field by yourself for some number of weeks and work out how everything was working. Well, that was the most humbling experience I've ever had in my life. Uh, what, what I could understand about how the world works in a book was nothing like I was observing in the field or I was capable of understanding and, and measuring or documenting in the field. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's many answers here, but much more needs to be known to provide those. which I'm going to read from Amy. Okay. Thank you, Andy. But I, I just, uh, I'm going to propose, I'm not proposing this, but just thinking about, I do a lot of the um, facilitation work of 
to get multiple different agencies to invest, we do a multi-purpose cost-benefit analysis process that shows where each agency can contribute dollars proportional to their mission in order to pay for more sustainable infrastructure instead of single purpose. But in the light of how we're discussing this, and I want to be really careful that I'm not saying that we should do this because it is going to seem like it's really shutting down research, but we might have a discipline about looking at how to extend the impact of the research that we're doing, if it's including travel, to be able to be felt by, experienced by more magnitudes of people, institutions. So, and maybe we're recording video or we're using that conferencing system of uploading video and then with the intention that instead of being seen by hundreds, it could be seen, designed to be seen and shared so thousands or tens of thousands of people can experience that learning, thereby maybe making it worth the investment of the carbon. So, on to Amy's question. She says her name is Amy Woodson Bolton. And her question is, I really echo the question just asked, which was 23 minutes ago, regarding the importance of community and interactions at conferences. I think it's quite different for a mid-career or advanced scholar versus an early career scholar to abandon this model. What kinds of new models of mentoring are we going to need if we move to these new kinds of scholarly interactions? And by the way, I do know some associations are working on these now. And she also says, also, by the way, I feel like we really have entered the world of the machine stops. And if Dina Christel in the room is in the room, she'll agree. So, that's Amy's question. I'll hand it back to everybody. Well, I'll jump in. And one thing that we've noticed in our conferences is that, you know, that kind of interaction, actually, we try to facilitate as much as possible. So, and this is where it's sort of like a cultural thing. So, one thing that we do is whenever people are participating in the Q&A, we ask them to register by name and affiliation, but we never have their position. So that everybody, whether it's a graduate student or a senior scholar, is kind of on the same level, unless you actually go Google the person and research it. But we found, of course, that, you know, that means that a graduate student can ask, you know, a question to, you know, a senior presenter and have their voice count every bit as much. And, in fact, can develop relationships that way, too, that can last for a long period of time. I mean, because really what we're here at, and this is why it's such a huge and interesting cultural problem, is what is the relationship? How is the relationship sustained? How is it made? And social media has challenged that. And, furthermore, whole communities are now emerging all over the place online that never have a virtual presence. And, of course, they're bad, I won't say bad, but they're very worrisome examples of this, like Charlottesville and all. One never knew that that community even existed or was so extensive until it manifested itself as an actual face-to-face thing. Well, it should be the case that academia also develops a great online community, too, as well as just a face-to-face one. And, again, the merit of it is, you know, everyone could be involved in that community. If you can skip the problem of time, it makes a, you know, time zones and all, it makes a really big difference. Yeah, so. So, anyhow, that's my two cents. I think we have about five minutes left. Maybe to move away from travel and conferences again and going back to the first half of the very first question that was asked. Um, I was wondering um, especially probably what you, Andy, think of um, alternative providers of technology. So I'm thinking about stuff like the Ecosia search engine that is 
both carbon neutral and actually uses the advertising revenue um, that they generate to plant trees. So it, thinking of the very, like the way we actually do a lot of our research, which is in offices on computers, um, how, 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 what impact can that have? And are there other ways that we can change that? Um, thanks for the question. Uh, <laughs> you perhaps in asking the question, you get uh, a, a problem with the remote, removed, uh, disembodied nature of this work. Uh, so uh, I have been doing restoration reforestation for over 50 years. Uh, and know that um, to a very large degree, the work has got to include humans. Uh, and all of a sudden, we are talking about drones planting. Uh, and there is a, a tree people, is, by the way, is uh, the organization I founded uh, was one word with trees and people connected because when you separate humans and trees, we get into trouble as uh, Jared Diamond, the author, UCLA researcher, has documented that you know in every civilization throughout history that where people forgot their trees, they ultimately disappeared unless they remembered them and, and re-engaged in the process of um, managing their ecosystem together. We we have been so careful about ever entering the plant, uh, counting trees for carbon offsets because so much of what you're seeing online of uh, trees being planted for five cents or ten cents uh, turn out to not necessarily be real. Uh, uh, or, you know, when you're giving carbon credits to that and yet there's nobody uh, making sure that the trees are getting watered. Uh, that they're being fed, that the right species are being planted in the right place, and that you are not destroying uh, one watershed ecosystem and uh, how it needs, to, how it is traditionally operated by trying to hit a numeric goal of units of tree in the ground that could be the wrong species, not being cared for, or that have um, a lot of ecological damage. So I'm just. Uh, the summary on that is be very, very careful. People are loving these, you know, plant a tree for every click on a, on a, a website. Uh, and people who I know and like, when they can't say they who are promoting these, they've never been to the sites where they're sending money. Uh, it's just wide open to fraud. I'm sure there's a lot of really good, legitimate, very good projects on the ground, but I'm aware that there are also other ones that aren't, and the the, uh, the accountability and feedback and standards just aren't there at all. So be cautious. Um, this is an important question for me because uh, we instituted a sort of carbon calculator um, uh, with registration. So everybody who registered had to sort of calculate the carbon footprint of their travel. And then it spat out uh, a number, a financial cost of carbon offsetting. We encourage everybody to pay that carbon offset. But we haven't determined where to put those funds yet. I was going to use carbon fund, I thought. But I thought maybe if all of you, A, could suggest where we should send that money, and then B, any other quick tips you could give us like that? So I had a, uh, we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion week on, on campus. And we invited in uh, SCOPE, which is a neighborhood-based uh, organization in South Los Angeles, and they brought in Trust, T-R-U-S-T-L-A, um, and there, uh, the idea came up of investing carbon offsets. If USC is really keen on getting to, uh, you know, carbon neutrality, and it can't do it purely through uh, demand-side reductions, then to take uh, any investments that it would make in a quote-unquote carbon offset and put that into the surrounding communities in terms of interventions. And that's similar to the state of California's cap and trade fund. The idea is that the, you know, the proceeds of that are going into interventions to reduce carbon. But if you look at it locally, the uh, sure, there's a need to 
uh, address carbon reductions, but there's also a critical shortage of, of housing. And so you could start to look more thoroughly into the provision of, of affordable housing and how that could, uh, how you could start to quantify some of the carbon benefits of uh, creating access to um, community members to, to stay in their homes rather than to move or to shorten commutes, shorten vehicle miles traveled. So um, I got one right there for you, Trust Los Angeles, which is a community land trust, yeah. So uh, in our Treat People's Global Research work, we uh, learned that um, cities like Australia has been experiencing what I informally call early onset uh, severe and extreme climate um, impacts uh, roughly 20 years ahead of us uh, from severe fires, drought, heat impacts in cities. So in 2009, in one day, Black Saturday in Melbourne, 200 people died of severe heat. Uh, and as Australian researchers looked at what was happening, uh, they correlated the time of death with uh, the temperatures. And th until that time, the, the mortality was being uh, blamed on their chronic disease, that people had chronic diseases that, that were killing them. Uh, when they started correlating time of death, they discovered that it was severe and extreme heat starting the third night of a heat wave when night of a heat wave when the body needs to cool down and it doesn't and it starts to fail. The emergency room visits, sometimes ambulance calls, rescue calls explode and then people die within the next two days. Applying that research into Los Angeles uh, revealed some really stunning and uncomfortable data, which goes straight to the heart of equity. Uh, so here's the uncomfortable news, buckle your seatbelt. Um, if you are a Latino in Los Angeles, you are 46% more likely to die on the fifth day of a heat wave. If you're African American, you're 48% more likely to die in a heat wave. So we apply that to what Scope is talking about, communities in, you know, in South LA, East LA, Northeast San Fernando Valley, Turns out they have under 6% tree canopy cover. Uh, they're hotter. Uh, the populations are carrying uh, more through environmental injustice and social injustice. They're carrying many, many more um, stressors and chronic diseases that make them much more vulnerable to the heat. Other parts of Los Angeles have 30 to 35% tree canopy cover on the west side. So you've got your inequities. So, uh, Australia, uh, Melbourne set a goal when uh, their research showed through urban heat island mitigation, uh, if they could create a 40% tree canopy cover and double it from 20%, they could save many, many lives in a severe heat event. And inner Sydney set a 50% goal, and they in, are investing millions of dollars to make that happen. Uh, Tree People's been leading a national urban cooling research collaborative to find out what are the numbers we need in LA. Clearly, we need equity. Now, here, that's the background. Here comes the, the uh, carbon offset. Uh, where does the money go? Mm -hmm. uh, we know, we, and we are aiming to increase tree canopy cover on an emergency basis in the, the low canopy communities where people are most vulnerable and where they're dying. The cap and trade program doesn't pay anywhere near what's needed to plant an urban tree, keep it alive, and get it established so people are protected. And so on, on the global offset market, all, almost all the money is leaving the country and going to cheap trees where you're pen spending pennies for them. and and the people doing the, the carbon calculating are saying, well, it doesn't make any sense for us to pay for an urban tree that costs hundreds of dollars to break up the concrete, plant the larger tree, and make sure it's watered and cared for so we actually get the protections of the heat protection, not just the, the sort of minuscule carbon offset that's so important. Um, so I, I thought I would just illustrate that, that 
challenge, and I hope that was useful, that um, the spectrum of implications. Great. We're basically at time, but maybe you want to. Well, I would just, I would tie that into, it goes beyond the, um, you know, thinking of a, a tree as creating a, a space, a local microclimate in the city. If we're really hitching our future, our mobility plan on uh, people powered environments and people using public transit, then the idea, we really need to start studying the thermal environments in our um, in transit spaces too, in our, in our streets. And looking at that, um, there's a massive uh, benefit to the public realm when you introduce shade. So Garcetti's already been out talking about shade as an equity issue. Uh, architects are, are you know, enthusiastic about creating their own sort of surrogate trees out of you know, building materials and you can sort of look critically at that. But I just wanted to bring up that kind of, there's an end user element as well as an atmospheric you know, component to the, the tree you know, topic. Well, thank you. I, uh, I found this panel extremely informative and really helpful. I, I really appreciate all of you joining us here today, um, virtually and, and present. And so I invite uh, the rest of the audience to give you a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you.